He was a pillar of the community. Yet Dr. Harold Frederick Shipman began killing his patients in his mid-twenties. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at 10 of the worst doctors in history. He demanded to know from my mother if we were twins, and my mother didn't know what to say. She asked if that was good, and I nodded yes. For this list, we're looking at medical practitioners who hurt instead of healed, either by propagating false information or by killing their patients. Which of these stories gives you nightmares? Tell us in the comments. Andrew Wakefield. Andrew Wakefield's already been stripped of his medical license. Now he's been called a fraud. He's been called, quote, one of the most reviled doctors of his generation. In 1998, British researcher Andrew Wakefield published a paper in the medical journal The Lancet, alleging a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. Going to a report of 250 pages, which I wrote, that I could no longer support the MMR vaccine. A few years later, however, investigations revealed that he had falsified data and had been paid over 400,000 pounds by lawyers hoping to sue vaccine manufacturers. He also reportedly expected to rake in $43 million a year selling diagnostic kits for his new proposed syndrome. The paper was retracted and Wakefield's medical license revoked. The investigation found Wakefield altered facts about patients in his study. In the years since, his work has been thoroughly discredited. Nonetheless, it helped kick off the anti-vax movement, which he remains a vocal part of. Linda Burfield Hazard. Fad diets have been around a long time. American quack doctor Linda Hazard was a proponent of alternative medicine whose rhetoric might sound familiar today. She claimed to have a miracle cure that removed toxins responsible for imbalances in the body. Fasting. Oh, and enemas that could last for hours. It was a novel idea. Pay to starve. She called her sanatorium the official-sounding Hazard's Institute of Natural Therapeutics, but locals called it Starvation Heights. Even though local residents knew what was going on on Starvation Heights, they never said a word. Around 40 patients died there, and over a dozen of those deaths have been linked to Hazard. After one victim died, uh, Dr. Hazard pulled the gold teeth out, you know, to sell the teeth. She was convicted of manslaughter in 1911. John Bodkin Adams. In just 10 years, British general practitioner John Bodkin Adams had 163 of his patients die while in comas. Death certificate, cremation certificate. I've signed both. Cause of death, cerebral thrombosis. Adams had a reputation for being incompetent, eating cake and falling asleep during procedures. But he also had another more calculating side. When police finally started investigating the deaths in 1956, they discovered that 132 of his deceased patients had mentioned him in their wills. They suspected he had overdosed them on opiates. Dr. Adams didn't even enter the injection to Mrs. Grantley in the treatment book. God forgive my sins of omission. It was morphine, my child, a normal dose. Adams was tried but was acquitted, with the judge later opining that Adams had been, quote, easing the passing of the dying. Have you reached your verdict? Yes. What is your verdict? Not guilty. Most assessments agree on Adams' greed, however, and the conflict of interest it created. H. H. Holmes. The building that the press dubs the murder castle is the secret of Holmes's evil ingenuity. A hotel he engineers as a death trap for guests to enter and never leave. Holmes is sometimes called America's first serial killer, although technically that title goes to the Harp brothers, highwaymen in the late 18th century. Nonetheless, Holmes is definitely one of the most sinister. Born Herman Webster Mudgett, he attended medical school in Michigan before changing his name and moving to Chicago, where people close to him, particularly women and children, began to go missing. College spawned a criminal fascination with the dead. Mudgett found that by digging up graves and selling bodies, he could pay for his tuition. Some were killed in his murder castle, a building he had constructed full of secret passages and chutes that dropped down into a basement equipped with acid pits and a crematorium. A precision operation that lets Holmes escape detection. He was hanged in 1896 for the murder of his accomplice, carpenter Benjamin Peitzel. 
Michael Swango. Michael Swango's story began right here in the Tri-States, but few could have ever guessed where it would end. This American doctor and former Marine had a God complex, but he was more fascinated by the power of death than life. During his stint at a Veterans Affairs Clinic on Long Island in 1993, patients began to die one by one. By this time, Swango had been moving from hospital to hospital, poisoning patients and co-workers, often using arsenic, for a decade. He'd served five years for poisoning paramedics, then changed his name and just kept going. All in all, he's suspected of murdering up to 60 people. Wanted by authorities, he fled the United States for Zimbabwe in 1994, poisoning more patients until he was arrested at last and sentenced in 2000 to three consecutive life terms. Knowing that he's in a place that he'll never um, hurt anybody again, I'm good with that. Giant Patel. He take, he's taken so many lives, so therefore he has to he has to pay with his own life. Nurses hid patients from him, and even colleagues called him Dr. Death. But somehow, surgeon Giant Patel continued to practice medicine for years. After incompetently butchering his way through patients in the United States, Patel became director of surgery at Bundaberg Base Hospital in Queensland, Australia in 2003, where he was linked to at least 87 deaths in two years. Hospital management ignored staff complaints until nurse Tony Hoffman blew the whistle to a local MP. Jane Patel's lawyers walked into court confident a guilty verdict wouldn't be the end. They could have him out by tomorrow, but if they fail, the 60-year-old will go to jail, possibly for the rest of his life. In 2010, Patel was convicted of manslaughter, but got off with fraud in a retrial he has been barred from practicing medicine in Australia. For a handful of his former patients, emotions came flooding back. I just went sick in the stomach when I saw him because it just all, it does bring it all back to you. Harold Shipman. He was a pillar of the community. Yet Dr. Harold Frederick Shipman began killing his patients in his mid-twenties. The case of Harold Shipman echoes back to that of John Bodkin Adams, in that Shipman was also a British GP who dosed elderly patients with narcotics. However, Shipman's case is less murky, with many of his patients in relatively decent health before he treated them. Predatory, I think, is, is, is the best way to describe him. Uh, he was preying on uh, the, the, some of the most vulnerable people in society. Shipman forged the will of his final victim, Kathleen Grundy, to make himself sole beneficiary. A well-respected figure, the doctor would have gotten away with it, except that Grundy's daughter contacted the police. In the year 2000, Shipman was convicted of murdering 15 patients, but he might have killed as many as 250. Relatives of Harold Shipman's victims left court tonight knowing that one of the most dangerous men seen in Britain during the last century had been permanently removed from society. He was sentenced to life in prison, where he hanged himself. Walter Jackson Freeman II, credited as the father of lobotomy, this American physician lobotomized almost 3,500 patients. It was sort of a jiffy lube lobotomy in that he could do them very quickly. The barbaric procedure was thought to quote unquote cure mental illness. Traveling across the United States in his lobotomobile, Freeman was famous for his ice pick method, in which a metal pick was hammered into the brain through the corners of the eye sockets. He would do up to 25 lobotomies in a single day. In 1943, he assisted in lobotomizing John F. Kennedy's sister Rosemary, which her father had arranged without her mother's consent. Freeman and a colleague scrambled Rosemary's brain until she became incoherent reducing her mental capacity to an infant's for the rest of her life. And they asked her to sing songs and recite poems, and then when she stopped talking, they realized they had gone too far. Shiro Ishii. Our next entries cover some of the most harrowing episodes in history. General and combat medic Shiro Ishii was the director of Unit 731, a covert Japanese research unit in China during World War II. Under Ishii's command, researchers experimented on at least 3,000 prisoners. They were subjected to extreme conditions such as frostbite, exposed to biological and chemical weapons, and had their organs removed without anesthetic. Sexual assault was common, with women impregnated to see if diseases transferred to their babies. After the war, the United States gave Ishii and his team immunity in exchange for research data on biological warfare. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.
You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Josef Mengele. Josef Mengele's name has become synonymous with evil. As a Nazi medical officer in Auschwitz concentration camp during the Holocaust, he became known as the Angel of Death. At the ramps, when the trains pull in, he wanted to be there to select the people into the right and to the left, those who would live and those who would die. One of Mengele's most chilling characteristics was his double-sided facade. He would offer sweets to children in the camp's kindergarten, then select them as subjects for lethal experimentation. Like German gynecologist Karl Klauberg, he conducted forced sterilizations of prisoners. He also amputated limbs, injected chemicals into eyeballs, and once sewed Romani twins back to back. He demanded to know from my mother if we were twins. And my mother didn't know what to say. She asked if that was good. The Nazi nodded yes. After the war, Mengele escaped justice and lived out the rest of his life in Argentina and Paraguay. When the war ended, it was a natural extension of Argentina's role during the war to it, for it to receive Nazis afterwards.